Hey buds, welcome to another week of the Homegrown Helpers. This is your host, Rob Smith, bringing you another homegrow interview jam-packed with advice to help you excel at cannabis cultivation. We're so pumped to be helping you on your journey to grow better, cleaner, healthier medicine. This week, I'm joined by Aaron the Grower from Northern California, and um, we had lots of topics to talk about, but we kind of got sidetracked and um, really only dive really deep into two topics. And we go long. Uh, my wife wasn't very happy with me at recording this. She had to, she wanted to take over the office, but it was just such good stuff that I couldn't stop recording. So what do we cover? We basically talk about drying and curing, the proper ways to do that. A- after, of course, covering Aaron's history and, and bio and, and kind of his grow setup, which is obviously very simple. He's an outdoor grower. But um, we really cover just drying and curing and and outdoor problems and how to help you get through to the final harvest. You know, we're all quickly approaching that time and and y'all should be in flowering stage and uh, seeing seeing some buds forming. And, um, you know, this is really when shit can hit the fan. And um, Aaron gives some really great advice to avoid bud rot, to keep your plants healthy and well, kind of during this home stretch. Um, the, the drying and caring conversation is is really key as well. What else do we have going on at the Homegrown Helpers Growcast and MyGrowPass.com? Well, if you haven't signed up yet, I really, really want you guys to. The fireside chat with Frenchie Cannoli and Madam Cannoli. Um, going to be so, so much fun. Um, we're going to send out some educational materials from Frenchie himself about the hash making process and um, some of their previously published YouTube videos just to make sure that you guys have them. And then we just want to save the fireside chat just for chatting, not educational stuff because he's done that a, a million times. We want to hear the stories and then allow you guys to ask some questions. So Jordan's going to be the moderator and um, we'd love for you to get guys to join. So go to mygrowcast.com slash fireside, or you can just hit up the link tr.e slash growcast or the Instagram bio link. Everything we do can be found right there. Uh, we recently just switched over to a Dino Myco giveaway. So enter in your email address and name and get entered to win a, I think it's a 750 gram bag of uh, Dino Myco, the premier mycorrhizal fungi that we just partnered with. We wrapped up the Green Craft Distribution giveaway. We had a few of our members, which are automatically entered into every giveaway we do. They won, and a few listeners won. So uh, check your emails. We definitely sent those out just a couple of days ago. And uh, yeah, look out for your codes as well. So what else do we have going on? Well, our friends Buxton Hollow Farm are doing some amazing things. If you haven't checked out their website, guys, do it. If you haven't checked it out in a while, do it again. Because every time I go back, there are new things. They just keep adding more and more stuff. So I was checking out the minerals and amendments. They have alfalfa meal in one, three, and five pound bags. They have calcareous algae, part of my uh, pronunciation, feather meal, fishbone meal, rice hull in one, three, and five pound bags. And then they have St. George black rock dust one pound package and really reasonable prices guys it's really crazy oh they have uh the saint george black rock dust in one three and five pound packs as well and then a local stone dust so you know this along with the nurse coir and the worm castings and all the other stuff they do you can save yourself 10 percent off by using the code gcl that's for grow cast listener 10 gcl10 to save yourself 10 percent off at buxtonhollowfarm.com locally sourced local company great products great people buxton hollow farm gcl 10 for 10 percent off one last thing before i let you get into this great interview with aaron he's going to be hanging out in our slack channel this saturday september 5th at 4 p.m pacific time 7 p.m eastern time 
Make sure you uh, hit the link in the show notes or follow the link in our Instagram bio and uh, make a profile, hang out, ask Aaron any questions you had after the podcast or just chat him up. Uh, Great guy, great grower. Now, let's get into that interview. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so excited to bring you this interview today. Perfectly timed, kind of was was delivered with a bow wrapped up on my doorstep for me. Um, this is going to be a, an in-depth conversation about outdoor growing and, you know, making that transition. But, but most importantly, you know, we're three weeks, four weeks away from the majority of people uh, listening to me that are going to have to harvest outdoor plants. So we're kind of in the home stretch and we want to help you kind of succeed and and get to that point where you get to harvest and experience the fruits of your labor. So today I have Aaron, the grower from Northern California. Welcome to the show, Aaron. Hey, thanks for having me, Rob. Absolutely. Like we talked about before we hit record, this is, this is just a perfectly timed interview and I am excited to hear about you, learn more about your, your journey to this point, and then we'll dig into some outdoor stuff. So why don't you tell us um, a little bit about yourself and and your history with cannabis? Cool. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. And um, I've uh, definitely I've listened to a few of the shows, and it's uh, I enjoy your content. And I enjoy what you bring to the uh, to the community. Uh, that said, uh, my story starts in Florida some 15 years ago, just messing around with planting seeds in a next to a skate spot uh, that a buddy and I had. And then killing those and going on to, <laughs> to try more in my closet. And eventually in college, uh, while I was at Florida State, I, I uh, had a closet grow the whole time. And I was pumping out some pretty decent weed. And, you know, the whole time I, I was studying psychology in college, I realized, like, I had two passions. It was school and it was also this, this plant. So fast forward a little bit. Um, I got into a graduate school program in California. I was growing at the same time. I kind of upgraded my grow a little bit and learned a lot, went to some conventions and uh, had a really nice harvest of some Chernobyl and just just really decided that, that that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I actually emailed my professor and I said, yeah, I quit. I, like I, I found my passion and it's it's something else. and. Uh, so let's see, I sent out a couple of resumes, like, cause I'd been growing for a few years at that point. So I sent out some resumes to some indoor grows in the Bay area in San Francisco and luck of the draw, I got hired at, um, an indoor grow to run this, it's like a 18 light, uh, indoor grow. Uh, we ran it well, it had decent look and bud. I won an award for, for something. First, first place uh, at this NorCal Secret Sesh back in the day for, during the Prop 215 days. Anyway, um, the city shut us down once the legislation started to change and they started looking into all these warehouse grows. Um, they didn't arrest anybody, but they shut us down, you know, permit wise. And um, so, you know, at that point, I had, I had been growing a little bit in my backyard, but I decided, okay, this is, I got to switch gears here and make a living with this because I had at that time also been a pharmacy technician for my full-time job. So I could be on paper, still rent a house and, you know, get things done in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, everything kind of started to fall apart. And the only thing left was, um, was growing, you know, long story short, I, I ended up with just this, this little hoop house in my backyard. And I worked really hard to, produce the best flower I could. And that year I say, I say, I saved more money than I had any time in the past working any job, doing anything else. And I, I loved it. I only worked like 30 hours a week and I really enjoyed it. Well, the quest since then has been to increase the size of my grow and decrease the amount of time I have to spend in my grow because I have a daughter now and I like to spend all my time with her and my wife and, um, and so for me, my most recent quest has been minimize your inputs, minimize your time, but still produce high quality, organic, outdoor cannabis. And so that's where I stand now. I, uh, 
I am in transition to actually starting a commercial cannabis farm in Oklahoma. So I've just bought land out there, getting it set up right now, just trying to funnel all my energy and time out, out in Oklahoma while maintaining a healthy garden here in Northern California. And um, so my garden now is, is not large. I've had much larger gardens in the past. It's like uh, 12 by 30. And, um, you know, it's enough to get by and enough to save money on this, on where I'm at and, uh, and get the project in Oklahoma going so that I can uh, really build something in a, in a place where the legislation is, is more constitutional. Right on, right on. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, you know, I, I always love hearing people's history of the plant and, and how important it is to them. And, and, you know, it never fails that, you know, we all share the passion and that's what brought us to this point. Um, we wouldn't be here without the passion of not just growing, but sharing that passion. So Aaron, I think this is going to be a, a quick rundown, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, how about you tell us about your current grow setup and, and what you got rocking out there? Yeah. Um, start to finish, I have a little propagation area um, inside my homestead, which is basically just a, a 50 spaced root riot uh, tray with a little LED light over it. Now, I am totally off grid. So all my power is generated by a generator and I have there's no easements by the water company. We have our own well. So being off grid can mean a lot of different things. It can mean that you just you have one utility that you don't depend on the power company for, or it could be everything. And for us, it's everything. Um, we have a hundred amp generator that powers our properties, a couple trailers on the property. So it's a nice little homestead, off grid homestead. And um, so that that should be kept in mind for people that are listening to this because I prefer stuff like aero cloners because I feel like I have faster results, but you have to have power all the time. So our generator only runs for about 12 hours a day because it consumes fuel and we try to just save money. So they start inside this little propagation area. Um, then they go to the vegetative greenhouse or really it's for most of the year here in Northern California, it's just a vegetative area because I don't need a covered, you know, plastic because the weather's perfect. And um, not to so rub it there, in. Right? Not to rub it in. Right? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> by the way, I'm moving to Oklahoma, so I'm bailing on this perfect weather to for completely closed, sealed greenhouses, which is like way more expensive. But like I said, I would just rather live a lifestyle where I can, uh, where I can, uh, you know, where I have there's there's like equal respect for me as a as a profession. Right. So, so from the vegetative greenhouse or area where there's supplemental lighting, I and by the way, I have an inverter which I run small electronics on a battery. So an RV deep cycle battery. Mm -hmm. I have an inverter connected to that, which I can run small lights off of for a few hours every night. So that's what I do for my vegetative plants. Okay. Once they're large enough, they go up to my flowering space where I plant them in a submerged bed. So a lot of people, when I present this idea, they're sort of like, perplexed and then sort of like oh of course why not so raised beds right everybody knows what a raised bed is mm -hmm. what i've done is inverted inverted that i've dug out an area started with trenching so i would just dig a trench and fill it with soil mm -hmm. well what it's what it is now is an actual 17 and a half yard bed so most people would use 17 and a half yards to grow 200 plants <laughs> So I dug out this area. The plants have this extensive uh, like root space and insulation, indigenous microorganism exposure because the walls are actual. It's just, you know, it's just a hardware fabric. So it's quarter inch mesh. You can think of it as just a hard fabric with big holes in it. And the my topsoil actually just butts up against that red soil here, the natural clay, clay sand. So all those indigenous microorganisms can help themselves to come and eat the buffet and poop there as well, and and uh, and I get my my KNF. So see, a lot of a lot of KNF guys like the indigenous microorganism, uh, you know, implications of that. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. 
so that's pretty much it. And then I harvest, I have a dry room, which is, uh, you know, air conditioned, highly controlled, which by the way, when I'm during the tr- drying is the most expensive time because I have to keep the generator on almost all the time because I got to get the DHU, you know, dialed in and the, the AC has to be running during the warm months and drying and curing is probably the most underrated process in growing. So, but it's something I focus heavily on. Well, that's interesting. I, I was actually really, you know, thinking here as you were talking, like, does he just, you know, throw things up in a tobacco barn and, and let things go? But you bite the bullet and for two or three weeks, you, you know, properly slow dry and cure the way that it should be done, right? Yeah, that's exactly it, Rob. Uh, I think most people, you know, put a lot of energy into growing really good pot and that's all well and good. But if you don't, take that a plus weed and give it an a plus environment finishing environment Mm -hmm. you're bringing you're only going to make it worse so if i grow a plus weed and i put it in an a plus curing environment and i pay a lot of attention to it once it leaves that after it's been vacuum sealed so let me explain my uh, dry cure process um this is really crucial to good weed man anytime i don't care if you're indoor outdoor whatever so i just like to hop in here and, and then let you sure. go um so we typically say 50 percent of the work you know to really great cannabis comes after you chop down the plant so you know 50 percent comes while it's growing but the plant's going to grow the plant's not going to properly dry and cure itself so that's where we really come in and have to do our job to get to that premium final product yeah well said man that's that's exactly right i mean it's a really good way to put it because your inputs it's a measure of your inputs right how far do your inputs go and with growing your inputs only grow so far but with the drying process it's everything it's everything (laughs) exactly exactly it's that's that's where the artist grower thrives like you know Right, right. I mean, like, you know, everybody says it's a weed, so it's going to grow. And like we were talking about before, like I started, you know, homegrown journals or homegrown helpers to kind of flesh out the right and wrong way to do things. And what I've learned is there's, you know, more wrong ways to do things than there are right ways to do things. Well, let me give you a right way to do something. Yes, please. Give us give us a rundown. Start to finish. 60-60, great target. You don't have to hit it, but just try and get as close as you can to 60 degrees and 60% humidity, okay? Mm-hmm. Ventilation needs to be across the ground and across the roof. So you have, or ceiling rather, so you have no, there should be no direct ventilation in the middle of the room. And you should also be creating a vortex. So keep in mind that a square room needs more push than a circular room. Not that anybody builds circular rooms, but it just gives you an understanding of how to how hard it is to create a vortex in a square room. Any advice for for creating that vortex? I was always Absolutely. you know, I would always put the the intake on the floor on one side and the exhaust on the ceiling on the other side. That's a great way to do it. Ultimately, you can just put a you can take a flag and walk around your room and find out where or blow a hit of smoke into there. You know, you Mm -hmm. you smoke a bowl in there and just let that rip into the room while you're in there working, working your fans and stuff. What I like to do is, I mean, my AC is fixed for my dry room and then I don't have an outtake. There's no, you know, there's no gazauda. So there's, (laughs) there's just the gazinta. And, uh, so in that scenario, the only way I'm removing, you know, water is through the dehumidifier. Anyway, I do like to put my fans in the corners. Yep. So the the fan only needs a little bit of space behind it and, and it'll function properly and it'll pull air from the, from the side of the room that it's butted against. Okay. Um, and then you just want to shoot that air at another fan and then that fan shoots at another fan. Now I'm not talking blowers because blowers are so high speed. You know, those, they're like these circular, things that you put on the ground, they use them to dry carpet and stuff in apartments and like, yeah, I mean, uh, people have probably seen them at uh, water parks or, uh, yeah. you know, when they, um, I, I see them all the time at uh, rest stops when they've just washed the floor in the bathroom or whatever. They're trying yeah, to get no, it dry. I'm so talking slipping in. cheap $10 fans or $20 box fan from yep. Walmart, like really something low speed, low, high volume, low speed. So you just want a lot of air moving at a low speed. Okay. Once your vortex is dialed in and 
your temperature and humidity are good. You let that ride and you just keep a really close eye on it. And once you're, and it may take seven days and it may take 14 days. It's just, there's a lot of things at play here. How close you hang your weed. Not, none of that is super important, but you can kind of like dial it in and figure it out. Like where you hang your weed is not super important. I'll discuss the important details. Um, from there, I run it through a barrel trim machine. So this is uh, like a <gasps> net. <laughs> Which trim it's machine a, do you use? Oh, it's uh, well, I hope you don't have a sponsor of one. Nope. Nope. I just um, one of my businesses is uh, we rent out trimming machines. So. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, maybe you look into these guys, uh, Tom's tumblers. Yes. So, yep. Affordable, effective, does not destroy your weed, can destroy your weed if you walk away. Done it. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, like, it's just a really great machine. And so I hooked up with them. They hooked me up with a, like, I, I use their machine, their old one, their tabletop for like six or seven years. Mm-hmm. And I called them. I said, look, my thing's falling apart. It's time for me to get a new one. What do you guys recommend? And they're like, oh, we just dropped this new model. It's not even on the market yet. We're going to give you a discount. Blah, blah, blah. It was so cool. They hooked me up. I love this thing. Shout out Tom's Tumblers. So Tom, so Tom is a, I think he's a Mainer. He certainly looks like a Mainer. Certainly talks like a Mainer. But they're definitely a New England-based company. I've seen them at a ton of trade shows. And have you seen their latest invention aaron dude the python oh my gosh (laughs) like you guys need to go google this thing because um i think and i i've never seen aaron but i'm positive that they could fit six of each one of us in this thing oh dude you could trim a yeah you could trim a (laughs) three human beings and have this this thing is a closed box with slanted trim tubes through it yep and it freezes the weed as it goes, th- it dr- or freeze dries the weed as it goes through. So you can trim your weed wet if you want. I, and, you know, don't quote me on this because I would never do that. I would never wet trim my weed, but you can by freeze drying it in this. And I think it's, is it um, liquid CO2 that they pump into there? And it, yep. as it cr- super criticalizes into gas, it like freezes the weed. I mean, this thing, and I think it's $80,000, this machine. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the, the, crazy things i mean and to go from a simple tumbler trimming machine that has no blades i mean it's just the sheets of um i think it's plastic right like yeah like a fine plastic well, on the inside of the regular tom tumbler uh, mine is a is a net it's like a cloth well there's three there's three bags there's a like a quarter inch cloth net yep. maybe an maybe an eighth inch cloth net and like a mesh keef net and the Mesh Keef net cranks out some Keef, dude. I put my trim in there, yeah. run it for like 30 minutes and just collect this blonde wonderfulness. I throw it in the fridge for a week and then I throw it in my rosin press and I get just this beautiful blonde stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so goes in the, goes in the tumbler. My actual weed, let's get back to the curing process. It actually goes in the tumbler for about 30 seconds to a minute, depending on where it's at and, and how dry it is. But usually this is, at the phase of where it is dry enough to where the leaves flake off when they are kind of touched. So I spend that for 30 seconds to a minute. It comes out. I put it into a vac seal bag. I vac it until it's trimmed. So that's part of the curing process is that, you know, that vac seal process actually allows the moisture to escape the center of the weed and get to the outside of the bud, which is what curing is. and the final process of the curing stage is when I pour that bag out into the trim bin and it takes about, you know, anywhere from two to eight hours to trim that. Well, that brings that moisture to a ubiquitous homogenous level within the weed. And you have this um, finished product from that point and you can, you know, so that's my dry and cure process right there. Very nice. Very nice. Any, any tips for people to know whether their temperature humidity is too high, too low, things to look out for that might help them to determine that, hey, maybe I should lower the humidity or raise the humidity or temperature or whatever. Uh, kind of some troubleshooting advice. Sure. Um, well, the vortex is going to be your best friend. So before you put any weed in there, do your vortex. Guess what? After you put your weed in there, do the vortex again. 
because the weed, the buds that you just hung are going to be an impediment. Right. You need to recreate that vortex in a way that is distinguishable from just, you know, just a flush of air. And it's going to change, you know, when you put that in there. So that's, that's number one is that, is that secondary vortex check. And number two, you can actually feel after about two days, you can feel that the outside, the, the buds on the outside of your rack, wherever you're drying, are going to be drier than the insides. And so I have a system where I actually spin everything around. So everything I, I use Metro racks, dude. This is my wife came up with this. She's, she's a freaking genius. She she bought five Metro racks. So these are these like dry storage racks that you see in restaurants that are metal with wires and stuff. And we got, I don't know, 250 shower hook hangers. So the little S hooks. And we cut, we branched the, the plants and hang them by the branch on those hooks. And the Metro racks all have wheels, so everything can be moved. And so if you got a dry side, guess what? Just tuck that against a wall or another side of bud. So all this stuff is really flexible. And um, that's my style. I know that, uh, you know, Alex, uh, Miami Mango, he's got, I think it's him that has that, that, those rack systems. Yep, yep. Dude, those are killer. But for the poor man, for the homegrown guy, this is like the kind of like knockoff equivalent. That's what I do. So I used to have something very similar. Um, the Z racks, they're typically used in clothing stores and stuff. Sure. So they have two tiers. It's just a long pole. And I use the typical uh, coat hanger, you know, idea. Hang five or six stems off of that. And then I could fit 14 coat hangers on these racks. And those just move around. And, and you know, for somebody that's short on space, it's also awesome because you can, when you're working in an area, you can kind of tuck them off to the side. And then when you're l done working in the area, you just kind of open them back up and allow them the full space and, and drying capability that they need. So yeah, yeah. Perfect I love equivalent. the, the in, in ingenuity that uh, we all come up with to, to solve the problems that we have. That's it, man. Aren't we all like every grower, you know, is also a MacGyver. Like every grower is the kid in elementary school that was like taking apart vcrs and turning them into robots and shit mostly like <laughs> <laughs> so the the growers the the people that were growing before growing became like an industry right like yeah. um because there weren't things out there that were created for us now there is and people don't have to worry about that but yeah you're right no you're right you know, you're actually right it's sort of a relic of a time past because right. We had to make our own way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, like when I was growing, there wasn't the, uh, the plant training solution that I wanted and there wasn't anything made for cannabis growers. So I made it, you know, with the Atlas plant trainer and, um, got that out in the world. And, and now there's other things that are focused on plant training for cannabis plants. So let's, uh, one more question about the drying. The biggest mm -hmm. question we get all the time. How do I know when my buds are dry? When should I start caring? There's two ways to tell, Rob. You can feel the leaves. So if intuitively you feel a bud, squeeze it. You're not going to hurt it. Squeeze it. And is it still squishy? Okay. The leaves are dry. Sure. Is it too dry? The only way to tell, squish it. Is it ripe? It should feel a little bit soft on the inside, but mostly crispy toward the outside. Okay, that's the first way to tell. Secondarily, and this is traditional, but I don't always go by it, but it's sort of like a secondary way to tell is that stem cracking. But it, even then you're going to have some stems that crack and some don't, but all the weeds still ready to, to dry. It's just because there's uh, such fiber in a lot of those stems, such density that the moisture hasn't escaped yet. So after putting your buds in a jar, you start the curing process. What are some things? How do I want to ask this uh, without prodding too much? No, it's okay, man. Are there things to be concerned about? Like, how can you tell maybe you jarred things up too quickly or if they got too dry? Like, you know, if you've made a mistake in, in your dryness level when you start curing, uh, what should people do? You know, or how to tell that as well? A lot of the times, if you've made a mistake, 
in the curing process, first way to tell is, hey, and the second thing to think is, it's fucked. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know another way to put that, but like, you can't come back from hay smell. So it's, I always tell people it's better to over dry than under dry because you, that's going to, at least that way you have no smell. Okay. Because under dry means hay mold problems, you know, hay smell, mold, you know, actual black mold growing in the weed. But over dry, the worst that's going to happen is it's going to be really crunchy, really crispy, and it's going to turn into powder, and it's not really going to have the terp profile that you want. That said, there's a balance. And I would, I would just recommend you know, intermediate or beginner growers to focus on dialing it in, playing with it a little bit. And you know, that's the great thing about being a hobbyist is you can sort of, you, you know, if you got three or six plants, it's uh, much easier to experiment than it is when you have, you know, 20, 30, 200, a thousand plants. So, yeah, you, you hit upon all the, all the really key points, the, the smell of mold, like if it doesn't smell good to your nose, um, when you crack open that jar, then something went awry. Um, you know, the hay smell, typically my experience and, and tell me if you agree with this, the hay smell comes from too fast of drying. Uh, you're kind of, you know, kind of cooking those terpenes off, but also happens uh, if you choose to wet trim, even just a little bit. I, I've experienced the wet trim, and that, those are the ethylene gases actually retreating into the, the cannabis itself instead of uh, escaping naturally through the, the uh, stomata, I believe. Well, or maybe it might not be the stomata, but the... Uh... the oh, go ahead. There's another side to that, and whenever you cut a leaf that has uh, a living leaf, the chlorophyll actually splits from the cut. So it'll go be forced into the tip of the leaf that you just cut off and then further into the plant. So, you know, hand trimming or scissor trimming, maybe you cut a leaf, an individual leaf once, preferably, maybe three or four times. So it's not that huge of a deal. But with running the trimming machines, a trimming machine, as you know, probably cuts a leaf a thousand times. So that's a thousand little cuts of uh pushes of chlorophyll back into the bud um and that's that that chlorophyll smell that remains and leaves that kind of grass hay smell that we're all used to as it's as it's drying in that process and then drying too fast yes that can happen but the key with like let's say because i'm an outdoor grower dude i've i've dried bud in in like tobacco style like i've done that before well almost with no AC, with no ventilation, I literally just had to open the barn door to dry some bud, right. you know? And um, and the key to that is checking on it so rigorously that, because it can change on a summer day, that, that weed can go from not even close to being done, and an hour later you go to it, and it is crispy. Maybe you forgot to open the door. It's <laughs> crispy hypothetically maybe somebody maybe one of your workers who knows <laughs> <laughs> and then uh so that is how you get it that's how you get hay smell too but in my experience the worst hay smell comes from the the under drying hmm. because and uh, dude let me tell you a story about one time i had a branch break in the at the grow like in full sun and it just sat on my trellis net for like two days. I cracked it off. I noticed it finally. I cracked it off. I brought it back down to the house, let it dry, finish drying like another two days. It was pretty much dry. And, uh, and I smoked it. It had almost no terps when I was like looking at it and it was kind of brown, but I like broke it apart and it, dude, the terps exploded and, and it smoked really nice. It was one of my favorite smokes. <laughs> I'm a weirdo, I guess, but yeah, dude, it's, it's a complex process, I guess is what I'm getting at. And there's a lot of physics and a lot of chemistry at play, which is where kind of that's, that's biology, right? Where chemistry meets physics is biology, mm -hmm. but in the curing process, it's actually broken down into the chemistry and the physics. So it gets a little bit more intricate mm. and, and it's a dance. So, you know, just like everything else you have to take all of what everybody says. I mean, there's a lot of good podcasts out there. There's a lot of good information, 
You know, you just need to absorb all that you can and experiment with what really strikes you as making sense. Maybe you have a little bit of understanding of physics or of chemistry, and you can use that to to improve some of your procedures. Right on. Yeah, we say the same thing. Um, you know, find out what works for you, but the journal, you know, keep track of what works for you. And if it doesn't work for you, don't do that again. Oh, extensive notes, man. That, yeah. That's key, dude. My wife tells me I need to start throwing away notebooks because I'm like old school. I just write on paper. And yep. then, so I have like, it, it's ridiculous. I have <laughs> way too many notes. Guys, if you have your outdoor harvest coming up, I can't stress enough how important trim bag is going to be to your success, your sanity, your time, your energy, your effort. All of that can be improved with the trim bag. Check it out, trimbag.com. They have videos, pictures, reviews right there. I'm looking at it right now. I didn't know that trim bag was Patrick the Soil King approved. And if you guys don't know Soil King, he did an interview with Jordan uh, probably a year ago or so. Jeez, man, time flies, especially lately. You all know that. But just a great upstanding guy, really all about the industry and making things right and doing things right. So check him out, trimbag.com. I, I really urge you, if you've got more than just a couple plants outdoors, if you've got more than you know a couple plants that you're going to have to be trimming, use the code GROWCAST. Save yourself $30, plus get free shipping at trimbag.com. Trim jail sucks. Trimming sucks. You know the deal. Now let's get back to the show with uh, Aaron, the grower. All right. Um, we're going to shift gears. Last, um, last thing on drying and curing. I'm going to give myself a shameless plug here. Um, you guys should go check out the Atlas Plant Trainer YouTube channel. Um, there are a couple videos up about drying and curing. Uh, my drying video has 221,000 views, and my curing video has about half of that at 116,000. So hit up YouTube, Atlas Plant Trainer, and uh, some of that information I've definitely you know, learned more and could freshen those up. But I, I mean, it's still a snap test, you know, right temperature, right humidity, burp in the jars, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope I didn't counter any of your wonderful information because there's definitely a thousand ways to skin a cat. No, no, you and I are right on point. And um, uh, like I said, there are just things that if I were to redo those, I would just add on, like improve the messaging. I, I wouldn't change what's there. I would just improve and add on to it. So good. Let's shift gear to outdoor. Um, you know, we are here in the Northeast uh, as of we're recording this. It's almost September. We're trying to get to mid-October uh, to harvest our plants, if at all possible. And, um, you know, this is a really important time and a little stressful for some people. So I'd like to get your experience taken. And, and I know, you know, that beautiful California sun and weather, uh, as you described it perfectly, perfect, doesn't match with a lot of the other country. Um, but I'd like you to tell us, you know, specifically, how do we help get our plants from here on out successfully with, with the best results without losing things to bud rot, you know, other molds, pests, pathogens, all of that stuff. Like help our audience kind of kind of get through the next six or seven weeks. Sure. This is definitely the most difficult time in a grower or a farmer's life, especially outdoor guys, because the weather is conducive to pests. And, and like you're saying, mold for a lot of people in the Northeast and Northwest and, and even in the South. Mm. So, so I would say right now that my, my most common question has to do with, you know, how do I convert my IPM from like a spray to a biological control? And, you know, the, I mean, living biological. So like, <clears throat> like uh, bugs that eat other bugs. You want predator bugs in your garden, especially if you're flowering, because you don't want to be, first of all, spraying hard, horticultural oils on your pistols because that'll piss them off. They'll burn back a little bit and you'll lose yield. And nobody really wants to smoke that stuff. You know, you don't want to spray anything during, uh, I don't care how organic it is. You don't want to spray it when there's flowers on the buds because you don't want even a, a single, you know, neem oil crystal in your lungs at all. So 
So that said, the biggest challenge right now is figuring out what kind of program is going to work for you and your grow. So a lot of people that have just a few plants are going to start to face things like aphids, uh, russet mites, rod mites, spider mites, uh, thrips. Thrips is uh, dude, thrips. thrips is a killer. Yep. <laughs> like people, it's the most underrated yeah. pest because they carry around more disease and virus than any other bug by far. Aphid right there behind them. So the thrip, although they don't do a whole bunch of damage directly, they can really mess up a, a mono crop garden. So if you have one strain that you're running and you see thrips, dude, they're about to tear your garden apart. It's time to take action. And the way to detect thrips is the salt and pepper. Um, you look for the, the, the first thing you're going to notice is the salt. So on the leaf, it's actually going to look like white, tiny white dots. And those are actually originating from the underside, but you can see them from above. And the black comes later. So my understanding is that the black is the poop and the, or if you want to get technical, the frass, uh, the insect <laughs> does not shit where it eats. It poops on one side of the leaf and eats on the other. So just like you and I, it's, it's comprehend. It's like, it's, this is a really smart little bug. Okay. And it, and you can tell mm. when you go up to touch it, they're not very good flyers, but they see you coming and they will fly away. They'll just kind of jump to another part of the plant. So the way to treat thrips is, is at this point in time, uh, hang on, I'm going to pull up my notes so I get it right. So, <laughs> So in my experience for the thrips, the cucumeris, it's, you need a three-pronged approach because thrips are, are really hard to get rid of. And they continue to, to hit you, especially if you grow near trees, like oak trees and stuff. They just, it, you know, if you don't continue to fill that, that void with beneficial bugs, then they're just going to continue to take advantage of that space. So Amblyseus cucumeris is a predator uh, mite that will eat immature thrips. Um, and it also feeds on pollen. So you can have like a banker system and keep these plants or uh, these bugs around. If that's your thing, I'm not much of a banker plant guy because I've, I've switched to the sachets that the, uh, that the companies sell. It's basically like a slow release. You hang this little sachet on your plant and it slowly releases them over a period of five weeks. So I put, a new round of sachets out once a month, and that's the cucumeris usually, because I the thrips are harsh up here. Um, so one thing about thrips is they thrive in the soil, like they they will drop down and get their boogie on in the soil and have babies there. So you want to have a treatment down in the soil, and I use rove beetles for that. You can use a couple of different things, but in my experience, those work the best um, because they also treat fungus gnats. A lot of your indoor guys will will be wise to indoor living soil guys will be wise to put rogue beetles in their soil. They're highly predaceous. Um, the larvae eat. Let's see, what is it? They they can eat a whole lot. I can't remember, and I didn't write it down. But they're savages. Uh, then the last facet of your approach should be the uh, minute pirate bug. And and this is my area. I just want everybody to know. I should preface that like all these bugs work well in my area they some of them will probably work well in yours but some of them you'll want to find replacements for and of course i'm always open to emails and dms if anybody wants to get at me i can try and help them and i don't charge i'm not a consultant i don't charge i just may i just grow weed man that's all i do so if anybody <laughs> needs help feel free to hit me up so the minute pirate bug is your third facet and this is uh this is the technical name is aureus insidiosis which is like just a savage name and they go after thrips, aphids, mites, and even moth eggs. So if you want to prevent like caterpillars from eating your plants, the aureus are going to do a good job at that. Awesome. Again, that's a bug. I'll add one more thing. That's a bug that's going to do well on a banker plant system as well, really exceptionally well um, with something that's going to produce pollen like a pepper plant. Okay. One question I kind of had that comes up an awful lot, and um, I kind of, I think you hit upon it. In an outdoor setting, you have these predatory bugs. What's preventing your investment? I mean, you buy these bugs to dump on your plants. How do you keep them around? Like they just, I mean, you're outdoor. They just fly off, right? 
they go find another bug or another plant. That's right. That's right. And the ultimate goal is that they do fly off because you don't want them to have any food. That's the goal. (laughs) But here's the thing, dude. I can go out there. I spray my veg plants with like neem oil and pyrethrin um, and stuff oil X, which are all organic sprays. Um, And I do that. If I have an infestation, I do that like once every one to like three days to five, seven days, depending on the half-life of the chemical I'm spraying. And when I say chemical, please, everybody, pull, you know, pull up your jaw. It's everything in the world is a chemical because I'm spraying organic compounds. You know, these are, these dissolve in the air in 12 to 24 hours. Some of them a little bit longer. And those are the good ones. So, okay. So in regard to that, so. Yeah, you're going to go spray once a week and you're going to spend 15 bucks every spray and it's going to take you an hour and a half to two hours and you're going to get up at five o'clock in the morning to beat the sun so you don't burn your plants with phytotoxicity. Or once every week to four weeks, you can go to what is it, greenmethods.com and buy yourself $100 worth of um, bugs. And when you and releasing them is a whole lot easier than spraying, you know, you just walk up to your plants and throw them all over them and, um, or hang them like sachets if they're in flowering, because you don't want to just throw the rice hole and the sawdust all over your flowering buds either. So you want to hang those sachets in flowering, flowering plants. Now you had mentioned banker plants. Is that, um, to, to give those bugs a little something to feed off of while they're, you know, getting acclimated to the area yeah that's something that they that will actually keep them around uh theoretically (laughs) Um, you know if conditions are perfect it's something that you can it's it's a permanent home whereas the sachet is just a it's a temporary home right right and the permanent home the only thing i would say and the reason i don't use them is because i'm trying to minimize my inputs i'm trying to reduce the time i spend in my garden so I can spend it with my family. Right and if I have extra plants to grow, then I have less time to spend growing the plants that matter and, and then, you know, less time with the family. Well, um, I urge you and, and everybody else that's really digging this conversation to go check out the interview I did a long time ago with Simon from Sage Design. Um, he's down in Puerto Rico and... Um, he does a lot of the same stuff, but he, he talks a lot about the companion and banker plants. And, um, you know, if you follow him on, on Instagram as well, he talks a lot about like, Oh, I went over to this corner of the property and I chopped down this plant or took a leaf off of this plant, um, and brought it over and, you know, uh, made an FPJ and, um, you know, was able to eliminate this deficiency in my cannabis crop. So lots of good information between here and there. Um, go check it out. Right on. I really want to get into bud rot. Sure. You know, what can people be doing or what should people be looking out for to prevent, you know, the black mold and the bud rot from taking over the botrytis? Sure. So botrytis is, it's like the ultimate killer, right? Because we like to grow big, like dense, trichome rich buds. But, you know, the environment doesn't want us to because those <laughs> buds were, were meant for, well, not meant for, they were bred to be grown in a different sort of environment. And, um, and I'm not going to say indoor because it's hard to say something was bred for indoor. We've only been breeding this plant for a few hundred years, maybe a few thousand if you consider that intentional breeding. So the problem with big, beautiful buds is they don't allow for a lot of moisture exchange. And Part of that is the trichome coverage. Um, I did an episode with, I did a live with uh, Matthew Gates recently, Sync Angel Mm -hmm. on Instagram, where we discussed trichome ontogeny. And so what that, what that was looking at was how, what the purpose of trichomes in nature, you know, why they evolved. And, um, and that's relevant because that's what we want to grow for. But if we're doing something that produces trichomes, but then doesn't, like it, pre- it re- uh, prevents the production of trichomes at a certain point, then there's a tipping point. There's a, there's a thing that we want to hit. We don't want to go too far. We don't want to go too, too low. So first of all, pick a cultivar that doesn't bud rot in your area. That is the very first thing as an outdoor grower you should do. That said, I grow 
freaking 46 cultivars and half of them are dense and I have to find a way to prevent bud rot. And so that's where I rely on my indoor skills and I will hang big fans in my canopy or if it's not in my canopy. So if I, I do light depth, so I pull a tarp uh, from seven o'clock at night to 7 a.m. And I will actually have a 450 CFM fan pull air out of that tarp for about an hour after I pull the tarp. And because the plants actually release more humidity in the first 15 minutes when the lights go out than they do the whole rest of the night, in my experience. I would agree. So, and, and you can use that to your advantage. There's a lot of growers that run really, really high humidity to avoid bud rot. Okay. And then the, <laughs> you have to understand the dynamic, like fluid dynamics, but if there's a lot of moisture in the air, then it's not in the weed. Now that only applies for a period of time. That's like 90% of the, the plants stay. So if you shut the lights off, that plant is suddenly going to release so much moisture that it will bud rot. And it'll happen so fast because your humidity is already so high because the plant is suddenly releasing all that moisture in the bud. And um, so the idea there is to turn on a really high power ventilation and, uh, and pull that humidity out of the bud. And that only takes about 15 minutes, but I run it for an hour just to be safe. So that's the best way to prevent bud rot. Awesome. Awesome. You know, here in the Northeast, there's, um, you know, people are worried about um, butterflies and caterpillars um, because caterpillars will uh, poop and then kind of create that, that bud rot on the inside of the bud. Any experience with that? Any advice in regards to Absol that? Absolutely. So with caterpillars, there's a lot of different ways to prevent it. And, you know, you have to remember that these are moths and butterflies, just like you said. So I think I mentioned um, the, the rove beetle, was it? Or which one? No, it was the insidiosis eats the moth, egg, moth eggs. So that's a good thing to have during flowering. Always be releasing aureus insidiosis if, if moths are, or if caterpillars are a problem. But during veg, you want to be spraying BT. And you don't want to just be spraying any BT. You want to actually figure out what the species of the caterpillar is in your area that's hurting you. So you got to find a caterpillar. And it's as simple as finding the caterpillar, Googling the species, like, you know, searching it. You'll have to do a little bit of research, but you search a description until you find that one that looks like what you see. And or pay some money to an entomologist and have them verify it. Or my buddy Matthew, he'll do it for free usually. <laughs> and then you do a little bit of research on what has been effective, what species of, gosh, I'm going to mess up the name of this, but I think it's biothuringensis is BT. Uh, you're going to look up which species of that bacterial inoculant you will use to defeat that particular caterpillar species. All right. Does that make sense? I know that's yeah. complicated. But... No, no, I, I got it, man. Okay, um, cool. it's, a, it's a whole lot easier than being out in your garden all the time and picking those little you know, bastards off. <laughs> well, it's a long-term solution. You know, it's like, once you know, dude, those are the same caterpillars that are going to come every year. So right. you spray BT twice a cycle during veg and you know, because that's an inoculant, as long as you infect the plant with the BT, as long as the, the bacteria can survive on in the phytosphere of the plant, the, the leaf structure, that's going to go all the way to, to flower. And dude, get this. If you're making seeds, that's going to be on the seeds too. And when you sprout those seeds, that's going to be on the sprouts. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So long as you don't freeze or burn the seeds, you know, right. that's, that's nature right there, man. Awesome. Awesome. You can inoculate seeds. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to wrap things up here, but I, I, I have a feeling this is not going to be the last time that we talk. Um, I, there was so much more that I wanted to get into, but <laughs> sorry, dude, I, I'm like a, I can, I can talk about this shit like all day, every day. So that's what I, we I, love. <laughs> that's what we love. We'll just have to book a part two and after this airs and, and let it marinate a little bit and, uh, we'll get some questions from the audience and, um, and then we'll, we'll fire it back up. I'm looking forward to it. Sounds good, man. Any last bits of advice, any last words, and where can people find and connect with you? Um, my last bit of advice would be, and this is what has paid for me the most, is 
pay very close attention to, to nature, pay very close attention to your environment. As an outdoor grower, since this is my, you know, that's what we're focusing on here. For instance, when I go outside and I look at my plants, I'm scouting not only for like spider mites and stuff, but I'm scouting for beneficials. So know your beneficials, know the beneficials in your area. Aureus and Cidiosis are really common in my area. When I see them start <clears throat> producing on my plant and they're just, they're showing up out of nowhere, dude, I jump right online and order more because they're just going to breed and do better. So pay really close attention. And then my favorite saying as a farmer is there is no better fertilizer than a farmer's shadow. So pay very close attention to your plants and, uh, but don't break your back, man. Pay, you know, your family is number one. So reduce your inputs, but pay close attention. So you would put that on the, on the form. What do you mean by the best fertilizer is a farmer's shadow? I mean that you are going to have more success looking at your plants than you are, I'm going to get chewed up for this, reading a book. And I'm a book reader, so don't get me wrong. Like, <laughs> spend your evenings reading books. But, like, you know, spend some time with your plants. Scouting is what they call it. Look for bugs. Look, look really close. Like, you know, I got glasses, so I pull my glasses down and I pull the leaf right up to my eye. And, you know, maybe I did a foliar feed a week ago and I'm, and I'm looking to see if there's any granules of that stuff left on the leaf. Oh, yeah, there's some stuff on there. Maybe I want to rinse the plants off, you know, just clear the stomata. So observing your plants really closely is, is a farmer's shadow. And there is no better fertilizer, calcium, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, none of it. <laughs> Than, than your eyeballs on those plants. Yeah, I, I think um, I think what you're trying to get to is is book reading is great, but practical knowledge trumps it all, right? Like absolutely, yeah. Okay. Experience yeah. in the field is yeah. is what is what's going to benefit you the most. Yeah, I mean, you can read all the books, but if you don't put that knowledge to work, then you're not then you're doing nothing with it. So yeah, do do both. It's yep. a it's a multifaceted approach, like like many things. Um, you can find me at ATG Acres on Instagram. I'm all over YouTube these days. Let's see, I'm on Future Cannabis Project from time to time. Every Sunday, I'm on uh, Growing with My Fellow Growers, Cheap Home Grow Podcast uh, on YouTube, and then what else? God, I've done a couple other things that I can't remember right now, but just shout out to those guys, those invisible guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shout out. This is two weeks in a row or well, not by the time this airs, but uh, shout out to Ch Shane at cheap home grow. And uh, like you said, sync angel, Matthew Gates has been on Growcast a couple of times. So we appreciate the little community that we're all building here. And, and I hope you, the audience appreciates it. Well, so just want to say thanks again. Thanks you to the audience and uh, thank you to Aaron for joining me today. It's my pleasure, man. And we're going to hop on out of here and uh, wish you guys the best of luck. Happy growing. And uh, if you get a chance, hit up our link tree, linktr.e slash growcast. Everything we do is right there. If it's current, that's where you need to find it. Until next time, happy growing.